My name is Carol Strill Snyder. This is Leo Vieira. We'll be helping you through this session tonight. As you came in through the doors, many of you have brought donations. We wanted to let you know that those donations will be going to different shelters. If you'd like to know more information about which shelters, please go to the Peace and You website. The science and spirituality of doing good. This is the theme of the event tonight. Let us welcome the Peace in You awardee and keynote speaker of this evening, Dr. Stephen Post. He is the best-selling author of The Hidden Gifts of Helping, as listed by the Wall Street Journal. He speaks widely on themes of benevolent love and compassionate care at the interface of science, health, spirituality, and philanthropy. His work has been featured in periodicals such as Parade Magazine and O, oh, the Oprah Magazine. And on such immediate venues, on The Daily Show, John Stossel, 2020, and Nightline. He has addressed the U.S. Congress on Volunteerism and Public Health. His contributions to health care have been widely acknowledged. He is currently professor of the Preventive Medicine and founding director of the Center for Medical Humanities, Compassionate Care, and Bioethics bio bio at Stony Brook University School of Medicine. Dr. Post founded the Institute for Research on Unlimited Love in 2001 with a four-year grant from the John Templeton Foundation. The Institute engages in the scientific study of self-giving and altruistic love. He is an elected founding member of the International Society for Science and Religion at Cambridge University, a senior research fellow in the Beckett Institute at St. Hughes College of Oxford University, excuse me, um, a senior fellow in the Center for the Study of Law and Religion at Emory University, a senior scholar for the Positive Psychology Center at the University of Pennsylvania, and a senior faculty scholar in the Center for Spirituality, Theology, and Health at the Duke University Medical Center. Dr. Post is the primary author of nearly 200 articles in peer-reviewed journals. He has written eight scholarly books on altruism, compassionate care, and love. He is also the editor of nine other books, including Altruism and Health, Perspective from Empirical Research, and Altruism and Altruistic Love, Science, Philosophy, and Religion in Dialogue, both published by the Oxford University Press. In addition to the hidden gift of helping, he is the lead author of the Buckbluster trade book, Why Good Things Happen to Good People, How to Live a Longer, Healthier, half, excuse me, happier, Healthier Life by the Simple Act of Giving. By researching the effect of volunteerism and solidarity on the individual and social health, as well as by promoting its findings, Dr. Post has been spreading new hope and peace to the world. For this and much more, he will be receiving this year Peace in You, peace in you Award from the Valdo Franco later this evening. Please join me and all of us in welcoming Dr. Post to the podium. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you so much for being here to celebrate this wonderful evening. Uh, nothing could be more important than peace, and I certainly want to recognize Tivaldo Franco and Vanessa and so many of you here for your, uh, for your leadership uh, in this beautiful, spiritual, Christ-centered, initiative. I uh, want to make a few comments about the spirituality of giving and connect that with your own flourishing and your own thriving as givers. 
And uh, the, the title is It's Good to Be Good. How many of you believe that? I bet you all do. <laughs> I had a feeling that I wasn't going to be talking to a disagreeable audience. <clears throat> Although I must tell you that some years ago, some colleagues of mine wrote a very nice article where they had studied the recovery of widows and widowers from grief and bereavement after they've lost their spouses of many years. And it turns out that the strongest indicator of getting through that grief successfully was your ability to report informal helping activities in your day-to-day -day life, just helping people contribute to the lives of individuals in your neighborhood or your community or whatever. And it was a very powerful article, so I was invited to give a talk about this to the New York Society of Widows and Widowers. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I'll do anything once. So, so I went to this uh, event, and there were about two or three hundred people there, and I thought it went pretty well. People asked some good questions, and then at the end, there was a guy in the back of the room, and he stood up and he said, I don't care what you say, Doc. I don't do nothing for nothing. <laughs> and I knew I was on Long Island. No, I won't say that. I just do. <laughs> anyway. But uh, people sometimes don't realize that the real benefit of giving isn't because you get reputational gains or because people pay you back, but it really comes down to being in touch with a part of your biology and your spirit that is extremely beneficial to you. Just as a byproduct, not that we're motivated by these things, but as a side effect, the reality is that this is a very healthy and beneficial way to live. Some of you uh, may be familiar with an American artist by the name of Norman Rockwell, yes? Uh, there's actually a Rockwell Museum up in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. I was up there just a few weeks ago. He spent so much of his life in Vermont and, and, uh, and in Massachusetts trying to capture the real fun fundamental building blocks of a good, healthy society. And this is a picture that he painted in Stockbridge that appeared on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post. No relation, by the way. <clears throat> um, and you can see what it is. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And notice, it's not the kind of minimal golden rule, the negative golden rule, which says do not do unto others as you would not have them do unto you. That doesn't take much, you know. If I go home tonight to the hotel, and I haven't walked up behind some perfectly innocent person on the streets of Washington and elbowed them in the ribs, well, <clears throat> I can feel pretty good about my life, I suppose, because I haven't violated that rule. But when you put it in the positive version, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, that means that we're using our moral imaginations, our minds, our spirits, to concentrate ourselves on one big question. One big question. How can I contribute to the lives of the people around me? So here you have all these individuals and they're thinking about this. Notice, they're from every age group, old and young. They're from every spiritual religious tradition in fact, I'm guessing that that fellow in the middle there with the blue jean jacket on is probably a secular existentialist having read a lot of Sartre. And Sartre said, of course, in this wonderful section called The Look and Being in Nothingness, that if anybody even glances at you with an ounce of kindness, watch out because they're just after your pocketbook. Well, there may be some of that in the world, but the idea of painting the whole universe in such cynical terms is a very difficult thing because people lose confidence in their own good nature. But you see, he, even he, even, even this fellow in the middle is 
asking himself, how can I use my imagination to contribute to the lives of others? So there you have it. And take a look at their facial expressions. They're not uh, stressed out, are they? They seem to be in a state of relative peace and tranquility, or if you wish to say spiritual serenity. Uh, there is a kind of calmness about them. Uh, they're not engaged in destructive, hostile emotions, ruminating about all the nasty things that have happened to them in their lives, but somehow by just focusing their minds on the big question, how can I contribute to the lives of others, there's a kind of emotional peace. And of course, our subject tonight is peace, peace and you, and it begins with you, and this is a pretty good example of how to think about that. Now, we have brain scans from very distinguished scientists. I won't go into details. If people come in off the street, we bring them into a laboratory, and we connect their scalps with a brain reading device, a PET scan. We give them a menu of charities that they might contribute to. The spiritists, for example. We give them a menu of 20 or 30 charities that they could consider contributing to. When they get that eureka moment, I'd like to contribute to this organization, they check a line item box on their menu. In other words, they check a little box next to that item. And when they do that, a part of the brain gets active. And that part of the brain, don't write this down, is called the mesolimbic pathway. Oh, my heavens. I shouldn't say things like that. But I'll tell you, it's the deeply ancient part of the brain that's the center of feelings of happiness. And in fact, it even doles out feel-good chemicals, one of the four big happiness chemicals, dopamine. So when you're just thinking, notice these people in the laboratory, they're not actually doing anything to help actively. They're just contemplating, thinking about, dwelling on doing good. And suddenly their brain is active in a way that is enhancing of their emotional well-being. And these kinds of studies have been duplicated. They're, they're not even controversial, although they were a decade ago because there is so much cynicism in the world. So many people think that somehow the only thing human nature is good for is selfishness, and that's the only source of happiness. But actually, science says that's not true. Abraham Lincoln <clears throat> had a lot of problems with depression, as many of you know. Uh, there are whole books on Lincoln's melancholy. Melancholy is an old-fashioned word for deep and abiding sadness. <clears throat> and um, surprisingly, here in Washington, D.C., he would occasionally be seen walking out of the White House and uh, going over to Union Station. And of course, he was already very tall and he had his top hat on. He would, in one example, for example, uh, one case I can give you, he would uh, approach uh, a young woman and simply ask her if he could help her put her large suitcase on the train. He was regularly doing this kind of thing. And what he said was, when I do good, I feel good. When I do bad, I feel bad. Of course, he was a very spiritual man, too. You know, when he left Springfield, Illinois, he said famously, um, without God, I can never succeed, but with God, I can never fail. But here he's saying that somehow these small acts of kindness elevated his own mood. And I think that's something that's very, very important. This is an old passage from, from Psalms, the book of Psalms 1125. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed doesn't mean that you'll get a lot of payback. But it does mean that by coping with the challenges of life in such a way as to stay connected 
with the generosity in your hearts, you will, you will prosper. Uh, when I <clears throat> first came to New York in uh, 2008 and 2009, um, I was in touch with United Healthcare. Some of you have heard of United Healthcare. It's probably the largest managed care system in the U.S. I'd been writing about the health benefits of doing good for quite a while, and so United Healthcare wanted to know: Is this real? <laughs> is this true? And so here's what happened. They supported a national survey in 2010, so four years ago, of about 5,000 American adults, 18 years of age and older. And they asked these individuals, did you volunteer in 2009? About 41% of Americans volunteered. How much? Well, on average, about 100 hours a year. And if you break that down, it might be a couple of hours a week. So we're not talking about high thresholds of volunteering, just enough to create a kind of shift in attitude and emotion. And then here are the amazing responses to questions. Did volunteering make you feel physically healthier? 68% say yes. Did it make you feel happier? 96% say yes. And you know, that's pretty amazing because let's be honest, in these big international happiness scales, America's not doing very well. You know, we're down there in the low 30s, but people in Madagascar and Mozambique, uh, where they don't have a whole lot, but they have more community and they have more opportunity and expectation of helping others, they're actually a lot happier than we are on average. So you have to really take this seriously. How about stress? Everybody knows that many, many illnesses are uh, caused by or at least exacerbated by stress. And we live in a very stressful time. How many of you struggle with stress? Just let me ask you, okay? Every day? Yeah, right, every day. It takes a lot of discipline to work through your stress and get in a more emotionally positive framework. Here it is, right? 73% um, are saying that volunteering lowers my stress levels. And this goes on. People say they make better relationships. Sometimes I ask people, for example, college students, who are your friends? And their typical answer is, well, my friends are the people I party with. <laughs> yeah. But that's not very deep. Uh, when people involve themselves in volunteering activities and helping activities, they tend to meet new networks of individuals who are deeper and who contribute and uplift their higher values. And so friendships and relationships become more meaningful. People sleep better. You know, there's a whole new field of sleep science in American medicine these days. And we're taking it very seriously. Somehow people who volunteer sleep better. They have lower anxiety. And interestingly, you know, if you take, take this comparatively, let's just say on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being a really good drug that really is effective in treating a disease, I would say that Insulin is about a 9.5 in the treatment of diabetes. It's a good drug. And thank heavens we have it. I would say that for something like Alzheimer's disease, the drugs we have are probably a 0.02, very low, not very effective. I would tell you that right here, simply volunteering and connecting with your generativity in your souls and hearts and minds and bodies, that that's probably up there around a seven. If you could take this extensive benefit and put it in a pill as a compound and sell it at CVS, you would be a billionaire overnight. <clears throat> but the amazing thing is that you don't need a pill. You don't need a compound. You just need to be in touch 
with that which lies within you. So this is extremely interesting. Incidentally, about 25% of the Americans who volunteered in 2009 volunteered through their workplaces. So they were given time off on a weekly basis, even a couple of hours, and still paid. And they were out doing the most creative things that they could do in their wider communities. And in fact, that improved the bottom line in various companies because employees were more gratified, more satisfied, more committed, more engaged with customers. So however you look at this, it's a good thing. Where I am at Stony Brook uh, Medical School, I have some friends who are members of a group called the Stony Brook Stitchers. And <clears throat> what they do is they knit scarves and pillows and blankets for kids with cancer. And you look at these individuals, some of them are cancer survivors themselves, by the way, and you see this kind of joy and effervescence and energy and tranquility. Actually, they're very peaceful in what they do. And we now know, uh, scientifically, that when you engage in face-to-face -face helping behaviors, the brain emits a chemical called oxytocin. Oh, that's another terrible word. <laughs> this is bad, I know. <clears throat> but it is called, actually, the compassion hormone. And it's associated with feelings of inner peace. Again, a theme of our day. It's sometimes called the hormone of trust. It creates social bondedness and a sense of tranquility. And there you have it. Just like in that Rockwell picture, right? The golden rule. Here you have a real photo of people who are just doing something simple but very meaningful to them. And they have this kind of inner, inner peace. You know, the first time I'm aware of that the idea of loving your neighbor shows up in world literature is in the uh, Hebrew Bible, in the book of Leviticus. And it says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But I've always noted <clears throat> what comes before that particular phrase is what? You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In the late 1990s, a friend of mine who was the chairman of cardiology at Duke University by the name of Redford Williams did a very interesting little experiment, and I'll just quickly describe it to you. How many of you have ever heard of, a, here's another term, the, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory? The MMPI hands up. How many of you have taken it? Quite a number of you, yeah. I mean, if you go into psychological counseling or clinical pastoral care or psychiatry in many fields where you're, you know, social work, where you'll be working with individuals on a one-to-one -one basis, you take this set of about 350 questions. It's a big questionnaire. And it gives you a sense of your emotional strengths, and some of the areas where you need to be a little careful and maybe do some work, you sit down with a counselor and they kind of work so that you can, you can shape yourself in positive directions. Now this thing's been around since the late 1930s. And here's what uh, Redford Williams did. He picked out about 27 questions from all these hundreds of questions, which he associated with hostility quickly angered, hot-tempered, prone to violence, expletives galore, unforgiving, ungenerous, abrupt and callous. And he called this the hostility scale. You can Google it. It's been used thousands and thousands of times. And here's what he did. He's looking back now in time at people who took this test when they were pretty young. How many of you are 25? Raise your hands. Okay, I call that pretty young. Some of you think that's pretty old. I think it's pretty young. <clears throat> so they were tw people who were 25 years old in 1950, okay, and then he, and they took the MMPI, and then he wanted to know, okay, 
So what happened to those individuals when they hit 50 in 1975, 25 years later? Are you with me? And here's the amazing thing. The high quartile hostiles, the ones who had a lot of destructive hostile emotion, they had a death rate, we call it a mortality rate, of 20%. One out of five of them were dead at age 50. Of what? Mainly heart disease. Why? Because we know scientifically when you are caught up in these negative, destructive, bitter, hostile emotions, your adrenal gland on the top of your kidneys is kicking out lots of cortisol and cortisol converts metabolites into fatty acids that fill up your blood vessels in your heart with gunk. So they were mainly dying of heart disease. What about the low quartile hostels? This gives more meaning to the expression, go with the flow. But let's just say the more peaceful individuals, right? Their mortality rate, their death rate was only 2%, which is practically zero statistically. So what a difference. And this actually changed American cardiology. Now, when I was a kid growing up, you know, people said, well, you're going to be susceptible to heart disease if you have a type A personality. That means, first of all, you're running around with a New York strut from point A to point B. I'm not a New Yorker. I'm a Clevelander, actually, by nature and disposition. Um, you're multitasking. And then you've got these kinds of hostile emotions. But actually, nowadays, nobody really worries about that kind of New York strut rushing from point A to point B. And multitasking, even though it can be difficult, is not that bad for you. Here's the issue. If after this presentation, how many of you parked your cars? OK. If after this event, the, and you're driving down New York Avenue, and the, the person in front of you has the audacity to slow down at a yellow light. <laughs> and you fall full chested on your horn and yell out an expletive, then you got a problem, OK? <clears throat> and what's so interesting is that when you look at the brain science, when you just focus your minds on love of neighbor, on doing unto others, it actually shuts down those brain circuits that are associated with hostility, anger, bitterness, and the like. It actually turns them off. Your brain can't be in both activities simultaneously. So this old passage, it's just it's an old, old passage. You shall not take vengeance or bear grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. What it's telling you is that when you engage in love, you turn off these very destructive emotions. And that's a good thing. And by the way, you don't necessarily have to go to the Rocky Mountains in Colorado to Shambhala Passage and meditate for 40 days with advanced Tibetan Buddhists. Although you can, please. But all you need to do to make this shift is take a little time once a week couple of hours and contribute to the life of another human being. Now that's miraculous and it's also true. How about kids? Um, I saw some youngsters here actually at the, uh, at the doorway. That, okay, right? You, you like my tie, right? Okay, they, yeah, they like my tie. Thank you. I thought they looked great, by the way. So you wonder, how does this work for kids? So there actually is a very powerful study that got started in Berkeley, California, out west, in the late 1920s with 12-year-olds. They took about 300 12-year-olds, and they asked them, what makes you tick? What rocks your boat? What motivates you in life? About a third of them, 100, said, you know, I like to use my gifts, I want to use my talents to make a difference in the world, to make life better for others. I want to do something for others. Now, then they followed these kids their whole life long. Every 10 years, teams of psychologists 
interviewed them on happiness, on anxiety. They looked at their medical records. It turns out that those 100 kids, as they got into midlife, into their 50s and so forth, they had much lower levels of heart disease, much lower levels of diabetes, uh, asthma, and a whole series of other illnesses, and also much lower levels of depression. So then these people now, understand, they were 12-year-olds in the mid-1920s, so how old are they now? They're knocking on 100, right? I mean, they're up there. Last I, I sort of, I'm in a state of denial, but I think it's actually 2014. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so who's alive? It turns out there are probably 65 or 70 of these people who are still alive. Two-thirds of the ones who are still alive come from the one-third who was 12-year-old said, I want to use my talents to help others. So that attitude of wanting to be helpful to others shed a protective halo that followed those young people their whole lives. Now, it's not that there aren't exceptions. These are just scientific generalizations. I'm sure there were wonderful kids who at age 22 got in an accident and died or at age 28 had an episode of terminal cancer or whatever. But as a generalization, it's good to be good and getting kids involved at young ages is extremely beneficial for them uh, over the course of their lives. That kid, by the way, there is my son, Andrew, about, oh goodness, about 10 years ago when he was graduating from middle school. He's now, a, he's about 6'2", and he's a lacrosse player, and he's always working out, and thank God he doesn't have any tattoos that I'm aware of. <laughs> um, you know, one of the questions you want to ask yourself is how do you get your, your children involved in these kinds of activities, how do you provide the right role models, the right communities, how do you incentivize them? And I think that's one of the reasons why uh, when, when folks get married and they have kids, they, they look for a faith community of one kind or another because in a way that's their best leg up in terms of teaching their children the golden rule. This is a crazy picture of some medical students who are singing a cappella around Christmas time in the cancer center. And I'll just throw that in here. They're called the lymph notes, <laughs> the lymph notes. And this kind of looks like Abbey Road, right? <laughs> yeah, I actually took that picture. And so they're all happy and they, you know, they've been studying so hard, they're so stressed out, but they just take a little time to sing to the patients and they just light up. So doing this at younger ages is actually a really good thing. Now, a lot of you, I'm going to be very medical now. A lot of you have heard of AA, most of you, Alcoholics Anonymous, right? And uh, I'll just tell you that there are 12 steps in AA. And, uh, you know, the first step is humility. I can't handle this addiction. Whatever I do, it hasn't worked. So I can't do it. And then the second step, you're going to rely on a higher power a higher power, a spiritual principle that can help you in all of this. There are all kinds of discussions about moral inventory, making amends and apologies, but the twelfth step is helping other alcoholics. So if you go to an AA meeting, I'm not an alcoholic, I actually quit drinking at the age of 14. <laughs> Seriously. So I, I mean, other people were getting into drinking, and I, my two favorite uncles on, on different sides of the family died of alcoholism, and I thought I might be a little wired for it, so I don't drink. Um, but what, what happens here is you, you go to an AA meeting as an observer. Everybody has a helping activity. Somebody's a greeter at the door. Somebody else is making coffee. Somebody else is setting up the table. Somebody's passing out literature. Somebody is giving a testimony. Maybe somebody is sponsoring another individual into AA that particular morning or evening. Everybody's doing something to help other alcoholics. And this has a deep uh, meaning in AA in all 12-step programs. There are about 400 of them around the country now for Narcotics Anonymous, Overeaters Anonymous, 
Slay is Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous. I haven't been to one of those meetings. <laughs> but, um, <clears throat> the, um, so, so helping others really matters. Uh, where did that come from? The guy who founded uh, 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 AA, Bill W., Bill Wilson, he was from New York. It was in the 1930s. He was a total drunk. He was completely dastardly and nasty to everybody in his life. Uh, he was in Bellevue Hospital getting detoxed. And guess what happened? He saw a light. That's all he wrote about. He said, I saw a light. A light broke into my consciousness. And Bill W. never drank again. Never drank again. And he got his job back. He was actually working for a stock firm. And they sent him off to Akron, Ohio to complete a business deal. This is about 1934. <clears throat> and uh, he's in the Mayflower Hotel, being in Ohio, and I can tell you that's still in downtown uh, Akron. And the, the deal wasn't going very well. He knew it was falling through. So he had this temptation to drink. He, it was evening. He looked across the hotel lobby and he saw a bar. And he thought, I'm going to get a drink. But guess what he did? He had, he had a dollar in his pocket. He pulled out his dollar. He went into the bar. He walked up to the bartender and he said, give me 20 nickels. <laughs> bartender gave him 20 nickels. And then he goes out into the lobby and he, and he goes to the telephone booths. They didn't have cell phones, oh, please, okay, at that time. <clears throat> and, and, and he starts calling the names of ministers and rabbis that he sees on a list next to the phone booth. He's on his 19th nickel and he calls a Presbyterian minister named Reverend Tubbs. And he says, look, Reverend Tubbs. This is the weirdest phone call you've ever got. I'm just a guy from New York. I happen to be an alcoholic. And I know I can't overcome this right now unless I am with another alcoholic and I take responsibility for helping that other person because that lets me use my own experiences to the benefit of another human being. And so Reverend Tubbs says, I've got just the person for you. Dr. Bob, and Dr. Bob, the co-founder of AA, was an alcoholic surgeon at Akron General Hospital, who, by the way, made many medical errors, <laughs> and I think went unreported. <clears throat> and so Reverend Tubbs gets the two of them together that night in, um, in the home of um, the family that owned Firestone Tires, and they figured out the 12 steps, and they included this idea of helping others. So we wanted to know, okay, um, what happens in terms of recovery from alcoholism if you're a high helper, if you're, if you're helping other alcoholics? No one had ever tried to bring science to this. So what we found out was that you have a 40% recovery rate one year after going dry if you're a high helper. If you're not a high helper, your recovery rate is about 20%. So you double the likelihood of overcoming alcoholism in a one-year window if you're significantly involved in helping other alcoholics. Why is that? Well, maybe it's just because, look, if I'm going to seriously be of help to my fellow alcoholic, I better set a pretty good standard. You know, uh, Maybe it's because you kind of see how close they are to the edge and you re it reminds you of the seriousness of your own condition. You can interpret however you want, wish, but the point is that as the New York Times ran its science section on this particular study, you do a lot of good for yourself when you help others. You also see that depression levels decrease dramatically among the high helpers. So that's really powerful. And here are these two people, Bill W. and Dr. Bob, if you look at the big book, the, that's the blue book that AA puts out, it reads, our very lives as ex-problem drinkers depend upon our constant thought of others and how we may help their needs. Shoot back to Norman Rockwell. There it is. There's the secret. Just put your mind on how you can 
take your experiences and use them, even if they've been very difficult, to the benefit of another human being. And you will recover, or at least double your chances of recovering. A lot of clinicians these days, um, they struggle with health care. They talk about losing the music, about burnout, and so forth. This is a picture of Dame Cicely Saunders, who won the Templeton Prize and was the inventor of hospice. How many have heard of hospice? She actually invented the word. Uh, she, she, she created the world's first hospice in, the very, in about 1960 in London. It's called St. Christopher's Hospice. And by the way, she took the word from the medieval use where, where someone who was just traveling over hills and valleys in Europe uh, would spend the night at a hospice, which was usually associated with a, a monastery or a convent or something. It's just a place to rest. And she thought to herself, you know, dying is a journey. Dying is a journey. And so she took the word and she developed it in the context of its contemporary usage. I knew her pretty well. Um, so I was at a dinner in, in, uh, in Massachusetts, in Boston, with Dame Cicely in 1999. And one of my mentors in life, Sir John Templeton, was there. And uh, he knew her well, of course. She gave the evening dinner address. And she's 83 years old. Her address was, Why I Can Never Retire. And she said, you know, I get up in the morning and I go into St. Christopher's and I change bedpans for an hour or so. Just a menial task, but you know, that's what I do. And she said, then I sit on the ends of beds and I listen attentively to the stories of people who are dying. Because she said, when you listen to people, they feel loved. I think that's true because my wife has reminded me of this several times. <laughs> Actually quite often. <clears throat> and when I was around Dame Cicely, I've got to tell you, she had this incredible com combination of inner freedom, a joy that was more stable than happiness, a hope that was deeper than optimism. Uh, she was tremendous and radiant and very spiritual and very connected with that higher power. Um, but, you know, if you look at it, a lot of clinicians, some of you I know are with the uh, Spiritist Medical Group, a lot of clinicians these days are kind of disappointed in their professional lives. In fact, almost 60% say uh, that they're not too enthusiastic about medicine. And the major reason for that, 90% of them roughly, is that what? They don't get a chance to connect empathically just to sort of, as human beings, one to another, make contact with, uh, with their patients. And there's lots of studies now showing that uh, their um, uh, stress levels, their burnout, suicide attempts are lowered to the extent that they can keep in touch with this basic desire to care. And it's a real challenge clinically because um, uh, they have to get together, they have sometimes have to have retreats, they have to have balance in their lives. They have, to, they have to realize their limits. But the issue is, if they just get into the mechanics of this and lose the connection with that patient as a person and not just as a puzzle, they're going to have problems. Um, as far as mental illness goes, uh, there's absolutely no question that helping others prevents depression. Across the UK some years ago, 2008, uh, the foremost group of 400 epidemiologists got together and they wanted to know what prevents depression in cities, in suburbs, out in the countryside. And one of the five key contributors to prevention was giving to neighbors, giving to neighbors. Not bad. So I work a lot with Hopewell. Hopewell is a therapeutic farm in uh, eastern Ohio near the Pennsylvania border. It's actually in a town called Mesopotamia. That's not the biblical one, though. It is, though. It's, a, it's an Amish town. It's an Amish town. So people have horses and buggies and all that kind of thing. And it's a wonderful community because people with schizophrenia, with major depressive disorders, 
They come to Hopewell, they get referred there from the great mental institutions around the mental hospitals like McLean in Boston or um, uh, 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 down in, uh, in Houston, Texas, um, the Menninger Clinic. Uh, people get referred to Hopewell. And there are other communities like this. There are about 50 around the United States. And here are their healing values. Acceptance, home, community, nature, spirit, routine, benevolent work, helping others, and a healthy diet. By the way, in terms of place and space and healing, there's this famous study where folks come out of surgery in a hospital in Pennsylvania, and half of them have a window view of a beautiful uh, set of trees in the distance. And then the other half have brick right across, you know, two feet from the window. You know what I mean? You know, a, I mean, I, have a, I, go, I, I work in a hospital where some people have a view of Port Jefferson Harbor with the ferry boats and the seagulls, and other people just have this brick wall right there, right? So it turns out that the ones who have the view of nature have shorter hospital stays. Why? Because they're actually lower on stress, and one of the things that that does is it increases the speed of wound healing, because high cortisol levels affect the vasculature system, they slow wound healing by about 40% and also uh, affect hippocampal atrophy. In other words, they cause memory problems. High levels cause memory problems. Less pain, fewer minor complications, and better emotional health, uh, well-being. This has been repeated time and time again. So here it is, you know. And actually, this is how American psychiatry got started. Uh, Philadelphia Quakers like Thomas Scattergood, there's a nice name, right? Thomas Scattergood and Kirkbride began the American Psychiatric Association on these principles of creating a community of love where you could have moral ordered existence where people would be treated with kindness and respect. That's actually how American psychiatry got its start. And incidentally, Frederick Olmsted, who designed the grounds of Central Park in New York, he, he designed the grounds of the six major asylums uh, in the 1870s and 80s. The idea was that you would have people out in nature, they would be milking the cows. They, at Hopewell, you know, the folks get up in the morning and they, they have their own chicken coop. They get their own eggs, you know. They, uh, they do incredible stuff and they love it and it gives them a sense of meaning and purpose because what, they're helping others within their, their community. So this is very, uh, very powerful stuff. Uh, just a quick comment in terms of patient outcomes. Um, I hate to say this to you, but um, about a third of every American dollar utilized in healthcare goes toward cases where individuals have been non-adherent to treatment. They haven't followed up. They haven't taken their medications. This is huge. And the single strongest indicator of whether a patient will adhere to treatment is whether they can say that they felt empathy and compassion from their clinician, from their primary clinician. There's something special about that relationship. Toby Cosgrove, who is the CEO of the Cleveland Clinic, uh, which is a big clinic, does a lot of heart surgery, they wanted to know what got people out of the clinic after major surgery. Now, important caveat, healed up, okay, quicker. Not just out on the street bleeding, right? <clears throat> and uh, the strongest indicator was whether the patient could say that their doctor cared for them in this more fundamental sense of the term. So that's really important. We have studies now showing that uh, diabetics do better with glucose control and cholesterol control when, when, they, when their doctors have higher empathy scores. So that connective tissue is a very healing thing. There's a poet, E.E. E. Cummings, he says, we do not believe in ourselves until someone reveals that something deep in us is valuable, worth listening to, worthy of our trust and sacred to our touch. You know, hey, let's be honest. So many people these days, they don't take care of themselves. Am I right? They just don't take care of themselves. We have epidemics of substance abuse, of, of obesity. It's, it's, it's just endless. You know, the healthiest community in America is the Seventh-day Adventists. But look, they've got all these teachings about diet, 
about exercise, about self-control. They have prayer and meditational techniques. They have a spiritual life. They actually have the greatest health levels in the U.S. of any population we have. And I think that, that the problem is, is we've lost a lot of these traditions. People don't have a reason to care for themselves. They, they, they just don't. And so one of the most important things in medicine is being the kind of nurse or clinician or whatever who allows people to feel that, yeah, their lives really do matter. That's something that Cicely Saunders could do. Immune strength is a famous study. Uh, there really is a biology to this. A fellow uh, at Harvard, he was a health psychologist named Paul McClelland. And he took undergraduate students, that's what these people typically do, and he had half of them watch a movie of Mother Teresa helping folks in Calcutta. The other half watched a neutral movie. Let's call it potato peeling in Ireland. <laughs> I happen to be half Irish, so I get, and my father was very British, so I get away with Irish jokes. I might ask you, what's the Irish definition of hospitality? Nobody knows. You make someone feel perfectly at home while you be a wishing they were. <clears throat> I mean, that's like, you know, it's 9 o'clock and the party's over and someone's still around and you're being hospitable, but you're really at the closet and you're trying to put their coat on. <clears throat> um, then my mother would say to my dad, well, why, Henry, why shouldn't uh, an Irishman tell an Englishman a joke on a Saturday night? My dad didn't know what to say. I have no idea, Marguerite. And then uh, she'd say, because he might, emphasis, might crack up laughing the next day in church. Just kidding. <laughs> so I went back and forth. But, and by the way, humor and mirth are good for you. There's actually a guy at the University of Maryland named Robert Provine, who's the foremost researcher in the country on the ways in which laughter is good for health. Anyway, in this particular study, the kids who watched the Mother Teresa movie, after they watched the movie, they looked at their immune strength. And the way they do that in science is they, they, they look at your, your, your saliva and they, they look at the level of a particular chemical called immunoglobulin A. And so those folks who were watching Mother Teresa had very high levels of, of immunoglobulin A. The ones who were watching the Irish potato peelers didn't. And then what McClellan did is he split that first group in half and he had half of them just dwell, meditate, getting back to that Norman Rockwell picture, just meditate on doing good to others. Just use your imaginations and think of yourself, visualize, right? Some of you do visualization, right? Visualize yourself helping others. And that group actually maintained that elevation in uh, immunoglobulin A, and the ones who didn't go through that mental exercise went back down to baseline. So this is called the Mother Teresa effect. You can Google it. There are probably uh, 30,000 references to it, right? So there's really something to this old age. I know, I know, how many of you are in your 70s and 80s? <laughs> okay, I'm not, I won't ask, I won't ask, I won't ask. ask don't ask, don't tell. Oh, oh, okay, there you go, right. I don't believe you. But um, you may be thinking, when I retire, I want to go to Sun City and rise up at noon for my first martini. <laughs> Turns out that'll cut your life down. Bottom line, we have now eight or nine studies from major universities, Stanford, Brown, you name it. If you look at older adults from age 60 to 80 or 65 to 85 or whatever, after you factor out all of the confounders, the bottom line is the ones who are involved in helping others, who are just spending a couple of hours a week volunteering in the hospital, who are just working in a literacy program for inner city youth, something like that, they're actually showing much lower levels of depression and also they're living longer. How much longer? Two years on average, right? So this is no longer controversial. I mean, this is, this is absolutely established. There's something about this that's really powerful. So you see this picture, this is two old guys. <laughs> really old guys. Actually, the one on the left is Sir John Templeton. And uh, he died when he was 96. And that's his older brother, Harvey, on the right. <laughs> I mean, Sir John Templeton was amazing. You know, I, 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 uh, 
I, I knew him so well, and, and he, he died in 2008, a couple of weeks before he died, from his deathbed, he said, you know, there's a book I'd like to write, but I'm not going to get a chance to write it. I mean, obviously. So <laughs> he asked me if I'd write it for him, and he gave it a title. And here it is for you theologically minded people. <laughs> he loved physics and he loved theology. Is ultimate reality unlimited love? <laughs> You'll find, you know, there's a little unlimited love flyer floating around somewhere in your material here. And I, I hesitated to do this for three years, but I finally decided to do it. And it's coming out in a couple of months. Um, it was a lot of work, but it was an act of loyalty to a brilliant guy who spent his whole life, he was known as the best investor in American history. You know, the Franklin Templeton funds and all that. But um, he says, you know, all my life I was devoted to love. And he left all the money, all his $5 billion, to, foundation, uh, to three foundations that study generosity, giving, forgiveness, gratitude, uh, all of these kinds of dimensions, spirituality and health. He was an amazing guy. I got to tell you, Sir John was so positive and so happy, and he never went down to Sun City. He was he was active to the very end, just constantly thinking about how he could use his resources to most benefit humanity. And he didn't he didn't want to be like Bill Gates and just you know and just you know provide more HIV medications in Africa. He asked himself, how can I use my resources? to create spiritual progress. And you probably know of the Templeton Prize in spiritual progress, which he founded. The first recipient was Mother Teresa. Um, so I'm going to skip through this. This is just me and Sir John some years ago. It's probably about 1990. Uh, he was one of the great joyful mentors in my life. And one day, and I'll end here, I was, I saw, before I went to Stony Brook, I was at the medical school at Case Western in Cleveland for 20 years, raised my family there. And um, I'm sitting in my office in 2001, and I get a fax from Sir John, who at that time was probably, you know, he was probably 89 or so. <clears throat> he didn't email. He was kind of too old to email. And he thought the fax was the most ingenious device ever created, just in case some of you don't appreciate fax machines. Right? I got a fax from him. It said, Dear Stephen, we need to found an institute that doesn't just study human disease and deficit, but that studies the greatest human assets. So I faxed back, Sir John, that's a great idea. What should we call it? He faxed back to me, the Institute for Research on Unlimited Love. Now, I, I admit, I had a moment of white male trepidation, because here I was in this big academic medical center, and all you know, I'm known for actually studying Alzheimer's disease, and and I and I and I thought my friends are going, they're all going to be asking me, hey, uh, what kind of love are we talking about here, and uh, you know, all that kind of stuff, and can science really study this? <clears throat> and so, I, I I faxed back to Sir John, what you know, he, he said unlimited love. I said, Sir John, maybe we should call it the institute for the study of creative altruism. Altruism is a really dry term. It's not spiritual. It's not controversial. It just, you know, it, it almost puts you in the grave, you know. Uh, and he, he faxed back. He said, uh, no, I think unlimited love, $8.9 million. And, 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 and I did what I think, Vanessa, where's Vanessa? I did what Vanessa would have done. I, I, I responded immediately. I said, Sir John, I love that language. It jumps right off the page. <laughs> and we were able to, to jumpstart the whole study of, of generous, selfless love and, and, and do a lot of things and, and uh, you know, make a big impact in the culture and in the country uh, with this kind of work because it hadn't really been done before. And so again, I, I owe all that to, to good old Sir John, and, and maybe that's why I wrote this book, I don't know. Um, and then The Hidden Gifts of Helping uh, is, 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 a, is a little book that captures a lot of these ideas that I've been telling you about. 
So I think we have, I don't know, we, do we have a little time for Q&A or are we done? Do, or, maybe five minutes? I don't, want, I don't want to be remembered as the guy from uh, Long Island who kept you from going home, going to the bathroom, made you fall on your horn and yell out an expletive or some other such thing. So just to, if there are two or three comments or questions, go for it. Bottom line, this is all a pretty superficial presentation because the key thing is that God is love. And you can hear all the science you want and all the exhortation, but in the final analysis, it's about passing the torch. And um, in our tradition, there's a great phrase, we love because he first loved us. We have the best role model. Yeah, I mean, well, so what happens with babies is, 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 is really important. I mean, oxytocin is released, uh, and, and, and not just in women, by the way, but in, in, in new dads, but to a lesser extent. Uh, but I have an older sister named Nora, and I'm convinced that the f fundamental role in life of having an older sister is for her to sort of give you those clear criticisms that, you know, keep you on the straight and narrow. So in my life, I've gotten three compliments from my sister. And the best one was about two weeks after my wife and I had our first daughter, uh, Emma. This is quite a while ago now. And I happened to be home, and my sister was observing me. And after a couple of days, she said, you know, Stevie, I never really liked you until you became a father. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, you may, think, you may think that's not good. I thought it was awesome. I thought it was great. I mean, I still remember it as like, oh my God, you know, wow, right? <clears throat> but so, so there's a lot of work being done now <clears throat> on, um, on kids, on toddlers. Uh, Paul Bloom uh, has a best-selling book out called Just Babies. And he's at the Yale Child Center. So here's what this guy did. He's pretty creative. He took about 200 toddlers, you know, between, say, one year of age and 18 months, and he showed them individually. Some of you have heard of this, a puppet show, yeah? A couple of you, some of you have read about this. So there's three puppets. First, there's this puppet that's kind of big and green and googly-eyed, and it goes up the ramp, and it tries to get to the top of the plateau, but it can't quite make it, and it falls down. And then there's a second puppet, that's the Good Samaritan puppet, that's like blue and square and, very, and has a big mame and you can't mix them up. And the second puppet comes along and helps the first puppet up on the plateau. That's the Good Sam puppet. And then there's a third puppet, the Mean Jack. So the first puppet's just to back it up there. Mean Jack comes along, pushes it down. So then what Paul Bloom does is he takes these kids independently so that there's no collective influence, no groupthink, if you will. And he lays out the three puppets in front of each of them, separately, okay? Ninety percent of them reach out toward, touch, or gaze intensely at the second puppet, the Good Samaritan puppet. So that tells you that there's something going on. There are a lot of people studying benevolent, empathic behavior in toddlers, but the issue is what buttons do we push? So we know that if you have good attachment between parents and children, where there's a lot of emotional responsiveness and security, that those kids, if you look at them 20 years later as they're reported by their peers, they're, they're described as more empathic themselves and capable of more enduring relationships and friendships, right? The so-called insecurely attached have certain clear deficits. So what buttons we push make a difference. Having non-parent mentors is really important. Uh, being the right kinds of role models, developing these assets in kids is really, really important. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> ah, so is it being prescribed? Is volunteering being prescribed? So actually out in San Francisco in the, in the Bay Area, the geriatricians prescribe volunteering. <clears throat> they recommend it. I mean, they, you know, and, and if you go into an office, you'll see all kinds of volunteer match type literature on the walls, you know. 
And, and, and again, you know, it, 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 no one shoe fits all, and older adults have different levels of physical and, and emotional strength, but, but it's encouraged, certainly. And um, I'm actually currently writing a paper with the professor of preventive medicine on just this point. Because, you know, uh, um, if this is true, um, there's no reason why we shouldn't, again, you know, Rx is maybe a little strong. Maybe that's a little over the top. But, but uh, as a recommendation, I think it's very solid. Yeah. So, but that's a, that needs to be worked on. One, one, on one other person. Back. From over here. Oh, yes, ma'am. Hi. Alzheimer's. <clears throat> yeah. Um, not that I'm aware of. Uh, as far as Alzheimer's goes, though, I will say this, you know, uh, that the deeply forgetful, I call them the deeply forgetful, um, you will find cases where when they become forgetful at these more intense levels, they actually become more, if you will, altruistic. There can be, in certain cases, a, a, a disinhibition of their natural capacities for generosity. Maybe they spent a lot of their lives burdened by these ideologies of, I don't do nothing for nothing. <laughs> but then they, um, they're freed from those kinds of perspectives. Uh, I knew an individual who was described by his family as really abrupt and really difficult all of his life and not generous in the least. <clears throat> he, was, he was diagnosed with probable Alzheimer's disease and he spent three years, he just completely turned his life around. He spent three years riding shotgun in the van that brought people, other people with Alzheimer's to the Foley Elder Healthcare Center in Cleveland. Uh, so these kinds of things do do happen, uh, but in terms of prevention and so forth, um, not that I'm aware of, although I do think that scientists now finally are accepting the fact that stress uh, does contribute potentially to dementia. And so maybe if you live a life where you're, you're really involved in caring for others and not simply focused on the self and the problems of the self and all the negative emotions that are involved in that, maybe that's a good thing. But, you know, it's not a strong scientific statement at all. I'm just being speculative. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Our guest speaker, Dr. Stephen Post, who received the Peace in You Award for his accomplishments in promoting peace through his research, in promoting solidarity, through volunteering. The award will be presented by Mr. Tivaldo Franco, the founder of the Peace in You movement. Please join us, Dr. Post and Mr. Duvaldo Franco. Would you like to say something? I'd just like to say thank you very much. Uh, what an inspiring speech from uh, Divaldo and all of you uplift this world and just keep up the good work. And I'm grateful to be here with you. And thank you, Vanessa. Congratulations, Dr. Post. And thank you, Mr. Duvaldo Franco, for such a beautiful initiative for bringing greater peace to all of us. Mm -hmm.